Hello, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us uh, today for another series of Future of Work C-Series Real Talk. My name is Ahmed Flex Omar, and I'm the CXO for MALA, the Muslim American Leadership Alliance. Um, MALA is a not-for-profit 501c3 based in uh, Chicago, but we have a global footprint through the United Nations ECOSOC, um, Economic and Social Council. We focus on three different areas, art, business, and culture. Today's event is focused on World Entrepreneurs Day, and that is celebrated every August uh, 21st. The purpose of World Entrepreneurs Day is basically to create awareness about entrepreneurship, innovation, and leadership throughout the world. And it's a perfect day also to celebrate people who start businesses. And today we are spotlighting um, entrepreneurs of East African uh, descent. And um, we have three incredible entrepreneurs that are joining us from three different uh, time zones. And I'm just gonna introduce them one by one and have them tell us a little bit about themselves before we get into the discussion. Uh, first up, we have uh, Luwal Mine. And Luwal is a South Sudanese entrepreneur. He's a video game developer and founder of Janoub Games. Um, Luwal had to leave South Sudan um, and flee war and move to Uganda with his family and eventually uh, coming to the United States. He's got an incredible story. And uh, Luwal, thank you for joining us. Can you um, expand a little bit on my brief intro? I know you're a very accomplished young man. Oh, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And uh, what the best way to celebrate, you know, entrepreneurs and people back home, you know, uh, it's just an honor for me to, like, you know, look at amazing entrepreneurs and, and the things that they are doing, you know. And, you know, the best thing I always tell people that, you know, entrepreneurship is doing, you know, things that we love and being able to, like, create, you know, a, you know solution to problems that we have faced before. And uh, and that's like that's that's the best thing that I love about, about entrepreneurs. And uh, it's really good for me today to be part of this conversation. As you say, like I think you've said everything about me and what I'm, <laughs> what I'm working on. As uh, yeah. yeah, first of all, like really, what inspired me so much to be an entrepreneur was you know the journey that I've taken. You know the journey that my family went through. Like and. You know, even before when they were back in the refugee camp, you know, like they were like they were doing things by themselves. They were like like entrepreneurs by themselves, being able to like create you know small products, and uh, and that really what inspired me so much to be able to like you know think about okay, what what can I do as a person, and that's why I was able to you know, it's, you know start uh, my own company, Genu Game. So Genu Game is a video game company that focuses on you know building video game for peace and conflict resolution. Because, you know, for us, like, I believe that, you know, games are a little bit of a powerful tool to be able to, like, you know, connect the world together and be able to, like, help people understand, you know, what other people go through. And uh, with that journey, like, it's something, like, that really helped me to understand, okay, this is something that I want to create. I want to bring, I want to bring something in the industry as, uh, as, uh, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's uh, that's that's awesome. And we'll, we'll come back uh, to you yeah. in a little bit because we have a lot of... Uh, questions for you. And um, second is uh, Muna Jama, and Muna is joining us from Hargeisa, uh, Somaliland. Uh, Muna is a beauty educator. She's a businesswoman, anti-human uh, trafficking activist from the UK orig originally, and she's the founder of uh, Muna Beauty. So Muna, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Awesome. Thank you for having me. Hopefully my internet won't be disrespectful. <laughs> I can um, notice some um, stutters. Uh, I am currently in Somaliland, as Flex mentioned. I am from Britain, uh, so I was raised in Britain for most of my life. And um, I chose to come back in terms of home because I felt like there was a market um, and not from a business standpoint, but just the fact that it wasn't exploited and people wasn't actually paying attention to the need. And um, some of the things that interested me were women had limited roles in terms of uh, the society, especially when it was visible. So um, like anything that would be seen by the public eye, there weren't much women. 
but everything else, I mean, like the street corners, uh, markets, everything, women were like the center front or the forefront of everything. So I felt as if, you know, there just had to be more opportunities presented and more people to take advantage of them. So when I came back, um, I myself was in the public eye and, you know, I thought it was right in terms of not necessarily from a media standpoint, but just from the aspect of being able to be a representative, you know, someone to look on the TV or like a magazine and be like, oh, you know, I look like her or I'm from the same place as her. So when I came back, there was a lot of women who came forward to me and said, you know, these are things that we'd be interested in. And beauty obviously was the main highlight. So that was the area that I focused on. And now um, I introduced the first accredited makeup course at a well-established university in Somaliland. And um, I've partaked in various projects. And one was a successful project that I actually worked with Flex Ahmed himself and uh, Bernie Martin, which was amazing because um, I think the element that I looked at it from, and I guess many people did back home, was the fact that it was men you know, men that were invested in women mm -hmm. and their future and their roles. Um, and for me, that was a big deal. So, um, yeah, I hope to talk and discuss some more about what I've learned. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mona. You're doing uh, great work on the ground um, uh, back home. And uh, full disclosure, I'm actually from uh, Somaliland and I was born in um her, her, her gesa. So uh, thank you, thank uh, thank you for being here, Mona. Um, lastly, we have um, Alpha. Me. It's our pleasure. Um, Alpha, thank you for joining us. Alpha, you are a lifelong entrepreneur, and you're also founder of uh, Pro uh, Spark, and you co-founded the company in uh, Singapore, and it's one of the fastest growing e-learning uh, platform. And as we all know, because the uh, pan a pandemic, um, the the world has been disrupted, and also um, the world of um, ed education. Now, Alpha, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and 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 your work? Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for uh, this opportunity to uh, to be here with you today. Uh, I guess I have to say good evening uh, from Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm, I'm calling in from Jakarta, Indonesia. And if you guys have never been here before, you should come down to Indonesia. I have. Beautiful country. I actually have. It's a lovely place, right? So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful pleasure to, uh, to be sharing uh, this stage with some of uh, perhaps some of the most amazing people in the world, you know, like, you know, Sister oh, Muna you. out there, Brother Luau, you guys are working on some fantastic things. You know, you're, you. you're out there trying to crack the nut and, uh, you know, make sure that you make, you know, this, you know, the world a better story. So it's always good to, uh, to, you know, to learn from the best and also to share insights from the people who are doing some amazing things. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I myself born and raised in Zimbabwe, so you know, African, African blood all the way. Uh, I moved uh, to Southeast Asia. Uh, I was in New York. I was in Brooklyn. So I spent a couple of years in the U.S., went to school in Chicago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I actually went to both, you know, I spent my time in tech, uh, in different industries in the U.S., uh, founded, uh, founded two companies in the U.S. Uh, but this is my first venture uh, in Southeast Asia with my, my longtime friend and a brother uh, called Subash. Uh, Subash is a great friend of, uh, of Ahmed. So what, so what exactly are we doing in, uh, in, in the ad tech space? Uh, so ProSpark is simply, uh, you know, a learning platform uh, to train, uh, upskill and reskill the workforce. Uh, we provide a learning management system uh, and also a content marketplace uh, for employees, uh, both blue collar and also white collar employees. So if you see our product across the board is being used by different industries from the gig economy. So think about the gig workers, 
Uh, if you've been to Indonesia or you've seen like the company called Gojek, one of the biggest rice sharing companies in the world, uh, they're using our product to train all their merchants in, in their super app. But we also have uh, you know, clients in the banking sector, retail, training companies, uh, and also working with some government agencies. So our business is uh, across Indonesia, uh, also in the Philippines. Uh, we love the Philippines. It's a great place. Uh, we, we have offices in the Philippines, Indonesia. Our headquarters is in Singapore. And we have recently actually expanded in, into the African market. Uh, we have now entered Kenya. Uh, we are now in Nairobi, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the process of actually uh, pushing Prospark within the, uh, the African frontier where I'm from. So I feel like finally Prospark is, at, is finally at home. It's no longer only in Asia, but we see some amazing opportunities in Africa. So at the end of the day, there's no secret about it. The future is in Africa. Uh, the next two billion population continent is in Africa. The biggest population per capita of young people is in Africa. The most beautiful people in the world are in Africa. So there's, there's no secret about it. So, so I think this is a great opportunity for us to come in uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, not to brag about what we're working on, because it's not easy to be an entrepreneur. I'm sure my, my friends, Loa and Mona, can tell you it's difficult to study. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like... Like it's, it's like you're living to survive for the next day. You know, you know, yeah, it ain't easy. Exactly, yeah. So I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think this is a great day and much respect to the guys at Mala uh, for the wonderful opportunity and the wonderful pleasure. But most importantly, uh, it's a privilege. It's a, it's a great honor. It's a privilege from God to be sharing the stage with some amazing people like Luau and also uh, uh, Sister Mona. Thank, thank you. Mona. you. Uh, thanks. Thank, uh, thank you, Alpha. Well, I guess we can um, start with you. I mean, you've had uh, quite the journey, Alpha. You grew up in Zimbabwe, left to go to the United States, and then you know ended up in Asia. So you're, I mean, you're a global citizen. So, what uh, can you tell us about um, what um, have you have you learned from um, your journey in terms of you know living and working in different parts of the world, especially in the different continents? Yeah. So I think, I think if you look into the, you know, if, you know, if you're born in Africa, man, and if you can make it in Zimbabwe, you can make it anywhere in the world. You know, uh, mm. some of us, we wasn't born in rich, in rich neighborhoods. I was born in a, in a city called Harare, the capital city, but I was raised in a high food, one of the biggest townships uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, in those places, you got to hustle, you know, and you're always, you're always futuristic and say, you know what, maybe there's something better out there for you. Uh, mm. So I think, you know, the whole idea of, uh, of, of making more in an in a advantage of the limited opportunities you might have, it makes mm. your brain a little bit excited to try different things, you know? Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, when I, so, when, so when I left Zimbabwe in 2020, 20, 2001, man, that's almost 20 something years ago, I guess, 20 yeah. years ago, right? So yeah. I was a kid. And uh, you know, got to the U.S. cultural shock, and like, okay, I mean, I gotta make it happen. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do: wash them dishes, you know, clean the bathroom, cut them grass, you know, do everything what you gotta do to uh, to make ends meet. But you know, at the end of the day, I've I've always had a passion for education, passion passion for technology, and the ability to leverage uh, whatever ecosystem you know you have. Uh, because you know, in the United States, it's not easy. It's not for everybody. Everybody, yeah, you know, we talk about it's the best country in the world, but there's some challenges in the U.S. We all know that already. So you know, uh, so yeah, I get there. Uh, you know, but at the end of the day, it's all about education, right? And you know, even if I didn't have much money uh, or a scholarship, you know, to pay my way out of school in the U.S., you know, we just make it work somewhere somehow. But I just knew that that you know, my only ticket out of this is education and to work hard and to build some global network. Uh, and, you know, and, and I managed to leverage that. And, you know, if you look at my background, my dad didn't want to school, my mom didn't want to school, they didn't work for Goldman Sachs, no one went to Harvard. I managed to get into, you know, to the, one of the best schools in the world, the University of Chicago, right? It's just straight hustling. So at the end of the day, you know, you go to Booth, it gives you a global perspective, you know, the network is crazy. 
And then I, I, I didn't move from New York City to Asia. I, I came to Asia to see my brother, like, because I was sick and tired of being in Manhattan. Uh, I, you know, I live in Brooklyn. I'm taking a train. I take an hour to get into the city. So I was like, I need to take a break a little bit. And then when I got here to uh, Singapore, and I was like, oh, man, this is great. Uh, the weather is great. Uh, the people are nicer. The food is good. And then I came to Indonesia. I was like, oh, my God, it's even cheaper. So, yeah. so, so yeah. then I, I just started seeing the opportunity, right? So I think, I think, I think the key to survival for, uh, to your question is already in ability to be adaptive, uh, ability to build networks easily. You cannot make it in Asia if you don't know how to leverage those two things. Because Asia is a yeah. different beast. It's a different animal on its own. It ain't no New York City. It ain't no Minnesota. It ain't no Chicago. It's a whole different ball game. And then when you come to Asia, Indonesia is a different animal than Thailand. Thailand is a different animal than Philippines. So among its countries themselves within Southeast Asia, they have a lot of different complexities. And I'm sure Subhash can tell you uh, some of the challenges, right? From starting a business, uh, registering your company, understanding different cultural norms, uh, how to close a deal in the Philippines is completely different than how you close a deal in Indonesia, right? It's a different culture. Indonesia is a Muslim country. You go to the Philippines, it's a Catholic country. So it's uh, so there's so many things you have to learn. But I think all in all, it's ability to learn, ability to leverage, ability to accept differences, and the ability to you know to take a risk. Without this, meet you know having the appetite to take a risk, uh, there's no way I'll be sitting here today and trying to make some things happen, right? So. And I think that's the culture and the blood of entrepreneurs. So you got to take a risk. You got to be willing to, to, to fail. You better be willing to make a big mistake. But at the end of the day, you know, what is there to lose? I ain't got nothing to lose. We, lo- we win, great. We lose, fine. I come back to New York and you know, get a job at, at McDonald's or whatever you got to do. So I think that's, those are some of the things I've managed to learn and experience uh, living in different continents. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, uh, thank you for that. And um, from what I'm hearing, you're also getting uh, started. So your your journey is just uh, uh, beginning, especially in the in the tech in the tech world. Um, now, uh, Mona, you sort of had a different uh, path. You were born in um, the UK, and then you you moved back home. So what what insights have you uh, gathered that you can share with everyone as an entrepreneur and your experiences? Awesome, actually. Um, I wasn't born in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. I was, I was born in Saudi Arabia. And when I didn't have a single tooth to my name, my mom decided to go to England. So um, she actually wanted to live in Sweden, but there was something about England that she liked. So she stayed. And that's where I spent my educational years and my first employment, learn how to drive a car, learn how to swim. So basically England was all I knew, right? Um, it wasn't until I got, I started working for a, um, well, Mercedes Benz. It was a very obviously well-established company and they gave me the opportunity to travel way more than obviously I would normally I was so captivated by living in the UK. So I would walk around with a shirt that said, I love London. (laughs) So I had no intentions of ever leaving, right? Because for me, it was like, you know, we had a mini city of everything, mini China, you know, mini Italy, you know, there was just areas you could just go. And for me, it was almost traveling, like, and when I started working for this company, because I loved cars, right? As soon as I could get my license, even though I, I think I could say it now, but yeah, I was driving before I got my license. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I ended up getting my license as soon as I could, worked for this company. And they basically, they took me in and they were like, look, you're going to start traveling. I was like, okay, that sounds amazing, right? Um, and I went to many parts in Europe first. And I was like, oh, this is incredible because I I got exposed to language, right? At first, when I lived in the UK, it was just words, right? You you hear people speak and it doesn't really mean much. But then when you understand it's more than just communication for some people, you know, it's um, a language of love, a language of pain, many things, right? I, I 
realized that it was more important to understand people. And the good thing about the UK, it was very multicultural. So there, there was like a lot of people you were already exposed to from different backgrounds. Um, and, and that was a blessing because when you're an entrepreneur, you are exposed to so many different people and English isn't their first language, just going off what Alpha said. And imagine I never had that opportunity in the UK and I would have had a sense of privilege where I would have almost assumed, you know, you had to speak to me in English. How dare you? Like, why should I speak any other language? And, you know, for someone that, you know, speaking now in hindsight, like for someone who respects language, I can only speak two languages fluently. One I just picked up on recently, which is my mother tongue. And the other one is obviously English. Um, however, I, I used to download apps that would allow me to speak like basic communication, which is like, you know, how are you and etc. in Arabic and French and that, and counting. Um, so when I went to these countries, I was comfortable, even if I pronounced it wrong, that I could communicate. And I think that gave me leverage in the entrepreneurial world, because it, it is a completely different ballgame. You know, it's not like, you can't just put it under the umbrella of just business because there's so much business support, but there's not many support for entrepreneurs. You know, you, you'd see funds and things like that, that yeah, they attract entrepreneurs, but then they'll turn around and say, has your business been running for two years? And it's like, no, but I've got a genius idea, you know? And um, you really have to do it all on your own. You have to figure it out. And then that's when everybody wants to get involved or at least give you a chance and et cetera. But I think there's no other way to do it. Um, but definitely incorporate everything that you've learned in your actual life, in real life, because that's what it is. It's real life, you know, what you're doing. It's your time, it's your money, it's your effort, those sleepless nights, everything, right? So for me, it was um, just really looking back, you know, when there was times where I was like, maybe I'm not qualified for this job that I picked for myself. But then I looked back and I was like, who else? You know, if not me, like for real, who else is going to do it? Because nobody else is doing it. And that was when I was like, okay, I'm actually going to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to become the best at it. So I'm going to teach myself. I'm going to, if I have to go get accredited, accredited then I'm going to go get accredited. If I have to participate in more like events or uh, speaking opportunities, then I'm going to do that as well. And along the way, you pick up on things. And that was the benefit of uh, being in the UK. But I want it you know, I want people to consider that as not just in the UK, you can be in Jakarta, right? I remember going there for the first time and the people are so peaceful. Like, I remember I was running late for my um, uh, flight back to Dubai and I, I was just panicking, I was panicking. And this is a habit I picked up in the UK and they were like, just calm down, don't worry drink some water and I was like no no I'm literally going to be late like we need to run and they're like no 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 don't worry and I remember the guy that was taking me to the airport was so calm that I fell asleep in the car and still made it for my flight and it teaches you what one thing that I took away from it was the fact that you know nothing is going to pass its course or its time right everything is given in its form and shape and manner whatever this situation may be but it's supposed to be the way it is and regardless of you panicking um overthinking the situation it doesn't really change anything so might as well use that time to do something more meaningful and for me it was sleeping <laughs> in the car which obviously I needed that extra nap but I mean in my entrepreneurial world it it really means that there's things that I've experienced and I was like, oh, man, I wish I would have done this. Or I should have done this. Or I could have done this. But because of the experiences and the chances I was given, I look at things like, well, I'm pretty sure because I did everything within my willpower, because I know myself better than anyone else. Right. So I did everything I could possibly do 
right? So that means it weren't supposed to happen. So now I've got to put my energy and time into something else, still the same focus, but just the angle is different. No, that's 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 incredible. So, do you feel that um, uh, moving, you know, from from Europe um, and uh, coming to Africa, like uh, things move a little bit more slower pace? You, first of all, are you are you able to sleep now? Or are you catching up on sleep? Do you know what it is? You never get to sleep when you're in the type of work that you're like that I'm in. You know, and you can both agree with me is and so can you uh, Ahmed so it's it's like even when you do sleep this is when I mean like on a Friday and everything's peaceful and you're like okay maybe not on a Friday for you guys right but here it's like an Islamic day but for me I'm dreaming about what I'm going to do tomorrow and I don't know if I'm necessarily dreaming or if I'm just awake and I'm just sitting on my bed but the the fact is it ends up being it turns from day to night because you're, you're thinking about, and that doesn't stop, that doesn't change. And obviously you should rest, exercise, occupy yourself. You know, I still do the things that I love. And one of the things that's incredible about what I'm doing is it doesn't feel like a job to me. You know, I love um, the purpose of beauty uh, and being able to take something from it, you know, like a positive experience. You know, there's the most common one was going to a beauty shop and buying a beauty product and getting the best beauty experience, right? That was the most common uh, experience you'd get in beauty. And it wasn't until recent years that uh, beauty entrepreneurs or beauty artists would actually invest in themselves and their work and be like, okay, you know what, actually, I'm going to look into the line of accreditation and get myself um, upskilled. And, you know, that gave me personally an advantage. So like, you know, living in the UK, that was the advantage because that opportunity was available. You know, so picture this, imagine I was still in Africa, I wouldn't have never been able to be accredited, you know, for what I do. And that just gave me extra confidence, but it doesn't stop there. You know, you, you then have to go talk to people that do, you don't usually talk to. You then have to take it a step further and go to a place that you, you know, wouldn't go. And that was what it was for me when I came to Somaliland, even though I'm Somali, um, and people expect you to speak Somali. That wasn't necessarily the case for me. When I first came to Africa, I actually went to Egypt and I was like, I'm gonna prepare myself for the African experience, but I need a little bit of sunshine and you know some good feels before I do. And I ended up going to Egypt and with Egypt, aside from most of the pretty pictures that were online, it wasn't actually much different from when I came to Somaliland. And I was like, wait a minute, like, I thought I was just going to see a lot of camels and the pyramids and like a lot of pretty things, but it was raw. And I wouldn't have had it any other way, right? For, for me, it was like the perfect uh, entry point to going back home. Cause I was like, okay, now I've got to manage my expectations, you know? So when I first came back home, I, I was challenged because of the way I speak Somali. Right. I've got a strong British accent. So people would be like, say that again. So I was like, I used to get really annoyed. And I remember I spent so much time in getting annoyed. I lost focus on why I even came. And I was like, I don't even know if I want to be here. So I went back to England and I was there for a bit. And I was like, you know, there's so many amazing people. Right in the line of entrepreneurs and other fields, but there were so many amazing people. And I didn't, feel, I didn't feel like I was needed as much as I was needed back home. And I, the, for me, my objective was just clear. I wanted to be a contributor to women and be able to provide opportunities where they can work for themselves and better their livelihood and better their you know, space. But I weren't going to do that if I wasn't able to overcome some of my challenges, you know, and that was obviously language was one of them. So I went and learned how to speak Somali. And when I came back, I was already cheeky. 
So when I came back, they couldn't handle me. <laughs> they were like, yo, I don't think we're ready for you yet. And I was like, well, you did say I should go learn to speak the language. And I actually, I got more of an advantage and I keep finding ways or things that annoy me. And then I work at it and I try to better myself. And I know then I'm a better educator and I'm also a better um, team leader. I'm a better manager. I'm a better CEO. Like, and, and then I can do what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, that's, that, that's absolutely um, amazing. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite challenging going back and, you know, mm -hmm. um, learning the language, but language is the key, you know, especially for communication. And I want to pivot to Lawal for a second, because Lawal, you traveled from, you know, Uganda to the United States. Like what, what challenges do you, did you face, especially around, you know, communication and the language? Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences? Yeah, for sure. Like I was just sitting here and uh, I think it's one of the best conversations I've ever had. I'm just learning so much. Like <laughs> this is just this is just incredible. Like, you know, when you say something really very important and you know, when you say that uh, I thought that I was I was needed more as much as I, I was needed back at home. You know, that that was really that was really incredible. You know, that was a great word because I think for us as entrepreneur, like, you know, what matters is like, what do we think about our communities? You know, how do we give back, you know? And on the way, it, it, it's a journey of like, you know, a lot of decision making. And those decisions might actually like contribute to your successes or contribute to whatever product that you're building. And, uh, and for me to leave from, you know, Uganda coming to the US, you know, it was, it, was a, it has a lot of challenges, right? But I think I was so ready for it that I didn't even, you know, uh, I didn't even like care about I mean, what challenges I'm going to face. Because I think that, you know, when, when, when you make up a decision as an entrepreneur and, uh, and think about, okay, this is something that I'm chained to it. This is something that is part of me. And uh, on the way, those, those challenges become, you know, part of you and you, they, they kind of like chip the person that you want to become you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, coming, coming back to the U.S., you know, my company, you know, when I started my company back in Uganda and when I was working uh, with, um, working on my game, you know, my focus was like, okay, I want to develop a game that, you know, I can help, you know, kids in the refugee camp to be able to have something to play. So my focus was not, you know, I'm going to make a game so I can make business out of it. You know, like what I was thinking was, you know, I want to create a space where, or product where, kids can be able to like have something to play with and then slowly slowly it started developing into like a product you know I was creating something that actually didn't exist actually that was needed actually that you know the industry wanted it you know so that's something that's something that really helped me a lot to be able to think about okay what is the next thing and then I was able to like come to the U.S. there was a lot of challenges because like you know the market in the U.S., the business, the way business is done in the U.S. is different from Uganda. Uh, second to that, you know, being able, you know, growing up in a refugee camp, you know, there are things that I did not have access to, right? So coming here was like, it was like so challenging that, you know, there are things that I want, but they were so difficult to get. And, uh, you know, Alfred, uh, Alfred talked about, you know, connection before, you know, connection is something very important for us as an entrepreneur. So coming, coming here, like I had to like start a new life and that new life I have to like start, you know, talking with people, hey, how are you doing? And, you know, like, you know, become friends with them, you know, and then that kind of like helped me a lot to be able to connect and be able to build a system of, of friends and, 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 and people that love what I was able, that what I'm doing. So that actually like helped me a lot to be able to like, you know, adapt and also like, you know, be able to like adapt to this society and be able to, to do things that I'm doing. And that's why I'm able to like, you know, work on the product that I'm doing right now. I've been in America for four, uh, four years now. Uh, it seemed like it's, it's, to me, it's like, it's a lot of years for me. Like, it's like, <laughs> I've been here for a lot of years, but I think that what helped me a lot was just, you know, the opportunity to like keep doing what I was doing and just thinking about, okay, this is the reason why I came here. If I, there's a reason if I come to America, you know, because of I want to see like the, the beautiful building, you know, the tall building, I could go somewhere in South Africa and see it. I could go somewhere in Kampala and see it. I could go somewhere, you know, 
in Kenya and see building, but I think opportunity is something that is really very important, and that's something that I always look for, and and that's something that helped me a lot. Yeah. Now, um, Luau, you've had you know uh, experiences in the refugee camp, and then you're building mm-hmm. um, this game to uh, benefit you know, young people in a refugee, you know, camp. Mm-hmm. So how are you balancing kind of like the business side and also the social impact side when you're building the game? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question, you know. Uh, I think for me was like, you know, building the game that I'm working on, you know. I think that, as I said before, like games are really very powerful too, that we can be able to like bring the world together. And uh, the reason is because, Games are not like movies where like you sit on a couch and then you watch a movie. You know, when you play a video game, you're actually making decisions, but the decision making there and become part of you. And and one of the examples I always tell people is like, you know, the first time I played a video game was uh, Grand Theft Auto, right? It was like the first game that I ever played. So when I play, you know, Grand Theft Auto, I was like, wow, like this, 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 this is something like it's part of me. This is, uh, even, and, and that time when I was in a refugee camp, I didn't even know that games are created by people. I just thought like they, they fall from heaven. Like, you know, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> and, you know, and, and when I start playing it, you know, it's kind of like inspired me because I'm from South Sudan, as I said before, I'm from a country that was ripped by a civil war. 73% of the population in South Sudan are under the age of 30. They're all young people. Some of them were born in war, they were raised up in war. And, and everything, when you look at, you know, when somebody like overgrow up with war, it's like, it affects their decision making in a way that everything they do, it's, 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 it's violence. You know, the, the solution is violence. The solution is this. And that's actually what inspired me when I started playing game. I was like, actually, this is great. This is a great way we can be able to like bring communities together. And, and when I thought about that is there's always amazing thing that we think about, and that is the change of behavior. When someone play games, you know, it kind of like change the behaviors towards like maybe each other towards based on the game that you're playing. And I remember I was playing a game with my friend and I and I killed his character. And the way he reacted to me you were like, why did you kill me? And I'm like, wait, what? You were like, why did you kill me? Because it become part of him. Like it, it's something that he's playing a lot. So how I'm balancing that is, you know, there are in our purchases that are always, you know, in the game, people buy, you know, people buy food, people buy water, people buy. So I'm partnering with a local organization. When actually somebody's playing the game, when you buy food in the game, you're actually buying somebody in a refugee camp food. When you buy water in the game, you're actually buying, you know, somebody in a refugee camp water. So those are like things that, you know, like when the innovations comes in, when we create companies that 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 are part of us, that's where we think about, oh, what's the next step? You know, am I just going to make money or am I also going to like have a social impact based on what I'm building so that has always been something that I'm really so passionate about because when I look back at my journey it's it's more than just a journey of being an entrepreneur it's more than just the journey of being a refugee it's a journey of somebody that actually had nothing in life and right now has an has an opportunity to create and you know and 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 bring something to the communities that and to me like I always say that you know Talent is always there. Everybody has talent, but opportunity is not. And I think those things are things that we think about, you know, when we are creating product, when we are creating, and, and as entrepreneurs, I said before, we can use our past and our, and, our, and, and, and our experiences, whether they are bad or whether they are good, to be able to create a sustainable future for other people that comes in. Because those, those, those experiences are the thing that help us to be able to create a product. And those products, we create those products based on, on the people that come after us, you know? And that's why like, you know, with all those, like that's why I'm actually like more than just gaming, um, also like looking into like with my foundation, being able to like give back to the refugee community and learn about technology. So those are things that we, we just worked on and uh, yeah. That's, 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 inc- that's incredible because, you know, you're incorporating education, you know, into uh, the, uh, the game. So you're not just, creating a fun platform. It's also a platform for education, but it's also a platform for um, social impact and, you know, giving back. Um, on that note, um, Alpha, um, Pro, uh, Pro, ProSpark is an e-learning um, platform. 
Um, and now that we we're just talking about game, uh, you know, games and gaming, is there um, gamification in, inside uh, the, um, uh, the the platform that you all have built? Yeah, so I think uh, I think that's a very good question, Amid. Uh, yeah, I think maybe just to take a step back and, and pick it back uh, to what uh, Brother Lowell just highlighted. Uh, definitely the future of learning is in gamification. Uh, you know, for you to people to be motivated to want to learn something different, uh, for people to improve, you know, retention of information, I think to what also Luau alluded to, definitely gamification enables those things to happen, right? So if you think about ProSpark, some of the features or functions we have that provide that value of, uh, you know, engagement, value of, you know, retention, uh, people want to come in and learn and enjoy learning. Uh, we have things like, you know, badges, uh, you know, point system, uh, leadership board, uh, stickers and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and we see a lot of our customers uh, are using some of that point system on the leadership board uh, to provide some form of a rewards uh, mechanism mm -hmm. Uh, to some of their employees within the ecosystem or some of their users within the ecosystem. Uh, if you also look at uh, the state of the, of the e-learning market globally, if you read some of the reports uh, that are published by various entities, whether it's uh, one of the biggest e-learning companies, Docebo or you know, elearningindustry.com, uh, most of them allude to the fact that you know, with virtual learning really ramping up, uh, you know, you're, you're estimating about 11 percent, uh, uh, you know, growth uh, year to year across, you know, for the next five years, uh, just on visual learning. Uh, you also have things, for example, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, micro learning itself, people learning in bit size information. And then you embed gamification in the whole layer of uh, learning curve it's actually going to revolutionize the way people actually gather information uh, and the way people actually engage with their learning content. Because if you look across the board, uh, and it is interesting to see, uh, you know, what other panelists also have some thoughts about it. If you look across the board, you know, the university system has now become so boring. Uh, you know, the, the, like the traditional brick and mortar, uh, eight to five in a classroom kind of, of a lifestyle, you know, I don't see that surviving for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of universities or high schools or schools actually going out of business. So if you're an education institution that is not willing to get on with it, with a new norm of uh, learning anywhere at any time, provide a blended learning experience for, for, for your students. And we know that most of the schools out there in the world, they were not ready for COVID. I mean, no one was ready for this. Right? And I'm sure in Somalia, there might be some institutions we're ready for the situation, but maybe most likely not 80% of the institution were not ready for this uh, COVID situation. And they had to adapt. Same thing as in Uganda, uh, same thing as in Kenya, same thing as in Indonesia. Right? So uh, definitely, how do you keep these uh, users? How do you keep the students? How do you keep these workers uh, working remotely? Uh, maybe 80% of their time want to learn something different, right? And now with COVID coming in, we see that a lot of people are thinking of switching careers. People are taking inventory of their skill sets. Uh, do you have enough, you know, IT literacy in you? Are you comfortable with cybersecurity learning? Are you comfortable with uh, how to work remotely? Uh, you know, engagement tools, uh, performance metrics tools. So people have to learn something different. But it's not easy to make somebody learn something with no incentive, right? It's not easy to convince people to do something different they haven't done. Of course, number one is a lot of work. Number two is uncomfortable. And that's when the gamification aspect of that comes into play. And we see that that's one of the biggest and the most popular features uh, within the ProSpark ecosystem. Uh, as we are supporting not only the formal employees, the traditional banks or retail, but we're also supporting people in the informal sector who might not have that propensity of learning something new compared to somebody who wants to become the next CEO or the, ne the next director of the company. So I think that's where we see 
uh, a lot of uh, benefits uh, of the whole gamification track. And I, I, I suspect gamification will continue to grow. And I believe that gamification will be the future of learning, both in the private sector, public sector, and definitely the education, uh, education institution uh, moving forward. Sorry, now on that topic, um, Alpha, you're um, on the subject of upskilling, right? And, you know, because the pandemic has disrupted so many um, lives and especially um, uh, uh, women. I mean, when you look at just the tourism industry alone, it's um, the majority of the uh, folks that work there, you know, are women. Um, those jobs were gone when the pandemic, you know, hit, and especially, especially in, you know, uh, Africa. And how do you see uh, ProSpark, you know, benefiting the next generation of um, African um, students that are looking to sort of like capitalize on, you know, the opportunities that are there in the world? Because when you have access, um, you know, to the, to the internet, um, you can do business with, you know, anyone, but you still, like you said, have to have that, that knowledge that um skill you know skill based um and then on top of that there's the language that we speak but then there's also a business language there's the it language there's all all of this so how is prospark bridging you know that gap you're, I, you're think, on mute. I think that's... you're good hello all right sorry yeah yeah go ahead. Just want to make yes. sure. Okay. No, I think I think uh, I think that's a very good subset question. Uh, when you think about the issue of uh, upskilling and reskilling, uh, I think. Sorry. I, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure you guys, because uh, I think Wi-Fi is acting up there. So hopefully everybody can hear me well. So if 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 uh, you're looking into me. the future of yeah, uh, skills. Uh, it's it's a very difficult time for a lot of different people right now, right? Uh, because definitely the labor market has been disrupted, as you watch, you uh, Amid, you already alluded already, and you know, uh, you know, ripped apart upside down. Uh, if you look at some of the industries in the United States, uh, the you know, grocery stores, supermarkets are having a challenge attracting people to come to work for them. Okay. In the United States, a lot of supermarkets, there was articles in the Wall Street Journal and the FT about this, right? Even if some of the supermarkets are now offering, I don't know, $15 an hour or a very high, minimum, uh, high, high, high hourly rate, but people are not coming back to work, right? So what else can they do? Some of them are now incentivizing, providing after school, uh, you know, uh, back to school college grants and things like that, because the labor market has been disrupted. And absolutely, we know there's some jobs that will never come back. That's a fact. No matter what it is, COVID has completely ripped apart some of the jobs that will never come back. And there's some new jobs that will come in. So the question is now is, how do you take this population, which I'll say maybe 60% of the labor market has been affected heavily, uh, maybe compared to 40 or uh, 20, 30. How do you take this 60% and be able to bring that 60% back into the into the formal economy that is the biggest headache for a lot of policymakers the biggest headache for a lot of startups and the biggest headaches for a lot of formal uh, formal formal uh, employers so if you if you look into uh where we want to play in right we believe that change for us starts with access at prospark we believe that people should get access to information anywhere at any time uh we don't believe just the traditional way of uh, brick and mortar learning strategy or learning infrastructure. Uh, we believe that if people are given the opportunity uh, to access information anywhere, anytime, they can log in, they can see different courses they want to take, they can look at their training gaps, they can learn so many different things. And, 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 and by, by providing that, that on its own, access is the key, right? So when, when companies or when institutions subscribe to ProSpark, that on its own is already a plus. 
all right? Because for you to change a society, the first thing you need to do is to provide access. You cannot change a, a mindset or change a value system without providing an access as the first place. And then when people go to ProSpark, they can have access to different content. They can have ac access to different uh, training journeys uh, or training certifications available within the platform or within the system itself in a simplified, gamified way. And where we want to make sure we do is how can we partner with some of this, uh, you know, uh, how can, you know, training centers, you know, apprenticeship centers, uh, training institutes across the region, how can we partner with some of those institutions in Africa? Uh, that way, at least we can be able to reach not only people, for example, in cities like Kampala or, you, you know, or, or Mogadishu or Nairobi, but how can we go to some of the remote areas where also they can have, you know, by the click of their button, maybe via WhatsApp integration, they can also get some form of a training. All right. Mm -hmm. So we believe that the skill sets you see in the tourism industry, maybe that person who was a receptionist, the job is gone. Maybe the job they need to do next is they need to work in customer service online, right? Mm -hmm. Remote working customer service. They need to know how to use a computer. They need to know how to, to chat. They need to know how to troubleshoot information. So those skills they have learned and not only provided formal learning at their company, but they also have to supplement some of the learnings with additional courses the Prospect ecosystem can also provide. So I think we, we envision the partnership with those targeted institutions on the ground that are working to address uh, the issues a lot of companies, countries are facing in Africa. That's the, the gap between the formal sector and the informal sector. And the people who are affected by this COVID and figure out exactly what trainings do they need to do? What, what skill sets are, are you gonna require for you to be able to, uh, to be competitive? Because at the end of the day, you cannot deny the fact that if you do not address that 50 to 60% of your labor market that has been disrupted by this, by this nightmare, you are going to have a lot of problems in your productivity index. You're gonna have a lot of problems in sustaining your economic growth. And most importantly, you won't be able to compete within the East African region, not only in East Africa, but also across the African continent. So yes, we, we believe that a perfect partnership between the startup community and the formal sector. And of course, we don't, you know, whether we like it or not, we have to partner with our government friends, right? The institutions. Mm -hmm. I think a perfect partnership that is collaborative, that is very informative and encouraging is the perfect solution for this population of people who have been severely affected by COVID because the number is huge, not only in Africa, but also in Southeast Asia. No, absolutely. And it's, um, if one thing that COVID um, has taught us is we're um, uh, more connected, you know, than, uh, than ever. Um, and that, and that being said, I want to get back to something that you mentioned Alpha and uh, pivot the question to Mona. Um, Mona, Alpha talked quite a bit about uh, the word access. So in, in the project yeah. that you know you created with um, your makeup certificate course, you created access. Can you tell us a little bit about how um, how how your program benefited um, young young women who didn't necessarily have that access, didn't uh, necessarily um, see those opportunities? You know that that were there in the world. Of course. Um, thank you, by the way, Alpha. That was um, a very engaging talk, uh, despite the fact that I missed the very start because of my internet. Uh, maybe we all need to discuss a really good internet company <laughs> and uh, introduce it in Somaliland. But yeah, aside from that, um, yeah, I think that was the reason why I was so driven because I, I couldn't understand how there wasn't any access, right? Um, you know why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can agree why Google is Google is because it gives you access to information anywhere and everywhere, anytime, and pretty much, you know, you could be underwater, on sea, it doesn't matter, but Google's gonna give you information. And that's why Google is Google. And people are so dependent on it. And, you know, when, when I came back and, you know, I first 
and I realized I was needed here, it was because there wasn't any access to information. There wasn't access to new skill sets. There wasn't access to short courses that could prepare you for real work. You know, for me, that was like mind blowing. So when I introduced the concept first to myself, I was like, okay, first I have to do it the right way. And I took the necessary steps. So I obviously first partnered with the accredited company in England, the British accreditation company, um, and introduced my course materials. Um, it was then it was in, uh, quali- uh, accredited and then it was passed back to me. And then I was like, okay, how can I make it engaging? Because it's one thing to provide access, but you need to keep learners engaged. And, um, you know, Alpha mentioned uh, the uh, incentives, like awards or like just acknowledging people for when they like complete a task and you get points. I've took part in a online course and I thought it was amazing in terms of like just how convenient it was. um, The fact that I was really involved because Look, bear in mind, I went through the whole education system from primary, secondary, all the way to university, right? And there was classes where I just slept. And I was like, mate, I'm pretty sure if I was given the opportunity to give that lesson, I could have done it in a better way, right? But it, you sometimes are providing access, but not providing engaging content. So that was two of the things that I made my main focus when I came back and I I knew there was the market. I did my market research. I spoke to these women and I was like, what are you going to get? Like, what are you going to get out of, you know, if this opportunity was available? And they were like, you know, I've got families to feed. I've got you know, I've got to be able to carry on. Like my father isn't involved in my life or my um, husband is abroad, you know, probably providing for the family. And, you know, sometimes I had women actually say to me, you know, we have to choose between electricity and keeping food on the table. And that's when I was like, yeah, I've got to move fast, you know? So the beauty industry is booming without a doubt. There is some form of cosmetic product that's being um, exchanged or transferred and it's constant. Sometimes it's unconscious, like people don't even know that they're actually involved in this beauty industry. And that means something as little as buying soap sanitizer this is all cosmetics right and it obviously comes under health um, and beauty and they go hand in hand so I feel like the beauty industry was neglected in Somaliland it's being used it's a part of people's daily life but it wasn't valued as much as it should have been and what I mean by that is it was it was praised if a child or a student was studying, um, I don't know, law, right? It's like, oh, you know, my child studying law. But if it's a creative field, kind of like uh, Lua, you know, if you're doing gaming, beauty, anything that comes under artistic or creativity, all of a sudden you're irrelevant. And for me, that was almost insulting considering how much or just how much this industry contributes to our daily life. It don't make no sense. And going off what Alpha was saying, like it's very important to pay attention to say the 60 or 70% that's been disrupted in the market because if we don't, we have a real problem. And it's equally, it's equally important as me saying, you know, this market is so important to us we consume it about 90% of the time. And no one's acknowledging that we need staff members or personnel that are professional within this field to keep it alive, you know? And whether that's like coming in from the creative aspect of teaching, producing, designing, um, educating, just being a, an all-round informative person, you know, and that comes under education, you know. And for me, the fact that that wasn't available, that access wasn't available to women or even men, you know, whoever wants to go into the field, because 
bear in mind these beauty products are created by men and women in factories so there's so many um, opportunities and different areas and fields that could be exploited once you have the skill set but it was just being looked at as oh it's just a night out you slap on some makeup or some skincare products and that's about it right and for me I felt like it was dying you know the industry was dying and it wasn't being given enough justice because, you know, picture this, I'd go downtown, right? And I'd get something as simple as a Moroccan soap. Now I know when we buy products in the Western world or many parts of the world now, even in Africa, you refer to brands and not the actual product. You're like, okay, Coca-Cola. But then there's a hundred brands now that actually produce drinks that taste like Coca-Cola, right? But then we still go to shops and be like, can I have Coca-Cola? And it's not Coca-Cola, right? So for me, I was like, how is there not a brand associated with beauty? And that's when I ended up being the first cosmetic brand in East Africa, where I was producing a beauty products, cosmetic goods, where you could be like, I want Muna Beauty. You know, I want to study Muna Beauty. And for me, that was access and also association. You know, people could associate uh, something uh, to beauty, you know, and when I made that available, I was criticized at first because people were saying I was spending so much time and money on something that just wasn't relevant, you know, it wasn't important. We were, some of the responses I got was, we were getting on just fine anyway, and this is not for the people that I was catering to, these are the odd um uneducated people that obviously was challenging me and for me it obviously um I, I spoke less and did more and that is when people started seeing exactly why it was important to make a beauty brand um, and also the education sector available and accessible so that people can gain knowledge and be able to provide that knowledge or share that knowledge to people who also want to explore the beauty industry in a more in-depth manner. And, you know, just going back to what I was saying, like when, when I was, when I go to downtown and I buy a Moroccan soap, right? Perfect Cosmetics is the brand that owns the Moroccan soap, right? And it's really nice, by the way, you guys should try it. It's, um, I'm not getting sponsored for this, but it makes your skin soft. So I, I remember going downtown and there was a guy selling the, the product, right? And I'm like, oh, can I have per perfect cosmetics? And he's like, what's that? Like, and I'm like, um, the green, I started describing it. And he was like, well, you know, he got a few products to me and he was like, is it this, is it this? And I'm like, no, the, the Moroccan soap. And he's like, Moroccan soap. And it literally says, I don't have it with me now. I do. One second, guys. It literally says Moroccan soap. So it's hard to miss, right? But yet he was uneducated in the products that he was selling. And this is why access to information is important because what good is products if people that are selling them don't even know what they're talking about? You know, for a split second, if I wasn't as patient as I was, I would have left. And that business would have lost the customer and even recommendation, right? The traditional, um, you know, word of mouth or just referring someone, I definitely wouldn't have referred that shop, but it was patience. And the fact that I work in the field that I was like, this is why, you know, you're going to need me sometime very soon. And I'm just going to have to wait around and, you know, wait for people to see just how powerful it is to be educated and to have access to information. Now that that is a really uh, powerful story, and what a great way to like sort of like sum up, you know, sort of the unintentional theme of today's um, event: is education and uh, and and philanthropy, and mm. really just living a life of uh, service. You know, because if we're not impacting the people um, that are uh, around us, then what what are we what are we doing, you know, in the world? So I know we're um, we we passed the allotted time, and 
I sincerely want to, you know, thank you all for uh, joining us uh, today um, to talk about this important uh, topic of entrepreneurship. You know, many young people are interested in entrepreneurship, but at the end of the day, they want to they want to see people that look like them um, really, uh, you know, bla blazing the trail. And um, the three of you are just incredible in everything, you know, they that you all are doing, but also in educating um, the, the next the next generation. I'm sure we're going to have you all on um, in uh, different capacities. Um, I want to thank you all again, because I know everyone's uh, joining from different uh, time zones, but I'll give you all the floor if you just want to say a um, final uh, couple of words. And Mona, you want to just say uh, maybe um, a few words before we wrap up and I'll, Luol and Alpha can, you know, do the same. Awesome. Honestly, it, it was a pleasure uh, sharing this opportunity with you both. Um, and thank you, Ahmed, for creating it. I, I feel like maybe sometime, um, I'm not sure exactly when, I guess it might be written, but we'll cross paths and maybe work together uh, considering our mission is Africa, you know? And as, as much as obviously we're from different parts of Africa, um, I feel like African people are more connected than ever. You know, it's almost like um, a third eye. It's like, oh, you African? I'm African too. So I feel as if we'll definitely exchange um, and contribute to one another's uh, experiences. Um, and I hope so. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Um, yeah, well, Luol, yeah. do you want to go next? <laughs> yeah. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much. Like this, this has been uh, what a way to, you know, to start a day for me. <laughs> and what a way to like, you know, uh, you know, to, to enjoy the weekend. This has been amazing, you know, you know, um, I'm going to go back to lunch, you know, look at uh, some work to today. And uh, I'm, really, I'm, I'm just so fired up right now. Like, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, the conversation and things like that. So what I want to say uh, is, like, just keep up the good work. Uh, it, it's, it's worth it. It's, it's, it's not going to be easy, but it's, it's the journey. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited. I can't wait to, to, to work together sometime because I know, like, whatever we're doing right now has... We are different, but we're relatable. There are things that we can be able to work together. And that's why we need platform like this, you know, to be yeah. able to connect and just learn from one another. And uh, it's the best way to grow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Luol. And Alpha? The final Luol, word. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's been a, a kind pleasure and an amazing privilege to uh, uh, listen to some of these amazing stories uh, Brother Luau and, uh, and, and my sister Muna already shared. Uh, I think these two are doing some ridiculously amazing work uh, that is definitely changing the game. Uh, you know, when I'm just listening to the story of Sister Muna, I'm like, you know, this is why, you know, education is important. And uh, possibly if that person had access to ProSpark or some platform out there, they could be better source people. So, uh, you know, I can see so many ways of how we can partner. I can see so many ways of how we can brainstorm to find uh, effective solutions that can help people, uh, that can get to the people who we need to get to. So I think today has been a wonderful day. Uh, I, I managed to... I learned some interesting things of what's happening in Somalia, uh, and I, 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 I've been, I've been, <laughs> I've been keeping an eye on that country for a little while because, because I have a friend of mine in in uh, in, uh, in. You guys should in come. Chicago in Hume. I know, I know, I should come. I know the food is great, so, oh, so it's I amazing. think it's a, it's a wonderful story. <laughs> it's a wonderful story. So I think let's. You know, the, the last thing is entrepreneurship is a flight of, of no any other feeling you could ever have, right? Things are hard. Things are not easy. And please continue to hustle, continue the great work, continue feeling the pain, 
the ups and downs that comes with it, the fear of failure, the fear of success is part of the journey. So never give up. And most importantly, not just for us, but for the people who look like us, who might be look, uh, who, who look at these videos for some of the script in the future. Hopefully we'll continue to inspire them and empower them for the future. So thank you, uh, Mala community. Thank you, Brother Ahmed, for the wonderful opportunity. Peace and love from the wonderful and the beautiful Jakarta, Indonesia. All right. Amazing. On that note, thank you all and have a beautiful day, uh, night, and uh, stay blessed and looking forward uh, to our next gathering. Uh, thanks. Right. Take care. Awesome. Awesome. Bye, Bye guys. Bye-bye.